Well, hello. Yes, I know it's been quite a while since the video has come from out of the basement, but with uh, COVID and work and some personal issues going on, I haven't been able to do anything. Uh, but now we are back, so I'd love you to enjoy the interview. And yes, I know it's not very well done because I was <clears throat> I was so excited to interview Matt. I didn't realize my Zoom settings had my face as a very tiny one and Matt is the full screen. Uh, I apologize for that. Next time I'll do better. Thank you. Hello. Welcome again to Out of the Basement Patio Time with Patrick. It's been a while and yes, technically this is not a patio, but imagine virtually this is a patio. I'm joined today with Matt Forbeck, who's been a gamer, novelist, uh, video game designer, and you know, father as well for many years. <laughs> So welcome aboard. All of those things. Thanks for having me, Patrick. <laughs> oh, no problem. Thank you very much. Um, so now I, I've I've read a little bit of your wiki page and stuff like that. To, uh, I got, I knew you from way back when with the Deadlands uh, yeah. books and then um, Brave New World and that. Uh, but I haven't been didn't realize how f prolific you actually are in the industry. Well, I mean, uh, when you're doing it for a living, you, you build up a lot of titles after a while, right? I, mean, I often say if, you know, if you're a teacher and you got a, uh, a book to put on your shelf every time a kid graduated out of your class, you would have a shelf like mine, right? It just yeah. ends up being that kind of way. It's pretty good. Now, I was reading you started playing D&D &D back when you were 13. So like quite a long time. Well, yeah, we won't say like exactly that. how many years because. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I'm, I'm 54. I'm an old man now, you know. Um, but yeah, it was a long time ago. It was probably 12 or 13. I think it was um, summer before. It was summer I turned 13 is what it was. Yeah. What, what got you started in that? Because that was what, second edition, I believe, D&D &D back then? was. No, no. Was, that was like 1902 oh, or something like that, right? So it was... Uh, was it the it first? The, oh, the, the box it set? The box edition. It was the first box set post uh, the original white box. So it was... Yeah. What happened is a friend of mine across the street, his mom picked him up Dungeons and Dragons at Kmart in a blue light special for, and gave it to him for Christmas. And then, you know, she was talking with my mom there having drinks. I'm like, oh, yeah, you should get the kids together to play this silly game I found. And you know, like, we're like, yeah, whatever. And then we didn't do anything until school got out. And then we started playing it that summer. And man, I just got hooked so hard. It was incredible. So we, I think we played just about every day that summer mm -hmm. and uh we didn't know what we were doing right so because it wasn't in the days where you get on youtube and you know, oh no there, there, there's it's none all. it's like you make yeah, it, we were all just kind of guessing you know it's all like parallel uh universes that we played in mm -hmm. um i i think we we were playing with the basic set but we ended up with the advanced D, &D monster manual which had just come out and so the advanced D, &D monsters were kicking the crap out of oh, yes. like they were slaughter so like every every day we would just get a party kill and they were like okay we got this far that's a save point we'll come back and you know tomorrow we'll come we'll roll up a whole new party i got mm -hmm. like whole man 12 or 16 or whatever my <laughs> cleric and just yeah but it, it kind of inured me to the whole this is a character you care deeply about it's like no we're just having fun killing things and well, we're yeah. see how far we can get and all that kind of stuff so. yeah have you played any 5e at all, or are you familiar with the new 5e? Just sort of comparison. Yeah, I have played some 5e. Um, yeah. I, a couple of things. I play at uh, conventions mostly with my kids. I don't have an a ongoing campaign going on, um, mostly because I'm just too busy to run something myself. A lot of my creative energy goes into my work. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, I'm like, do I really want to come up with a whole plot and do this stuff? I've been doing it all day. Uh, probably not. But um, but my kids are still encouraging me to do it, uh, and hopefully one of them will pick up the baton and actually Good. run me through something. <laughs> um, You're like, I've shown you all this stuff. Here you yeah, go. Here's all the tools, kids. Go fly. Be free. Take me with you. <laughs> um, but the uh, like, I wrote what six of the endless quest books, the pick a path books for Dungeons and Dragons. That was mm -hmm. during fourth, fifth edition right now. And I wrote Dungeonology, which came out during fifth edition. And I'm working on something that hasn't been announced yet. Uh, and I've done a couple other things for related things I can't talk about. No, no, that's all right. Yeah. Non-disclosure. But but I was gonna say you're right, because the the old school that they call the old school one is like you learn to make a character, but not care too much. Like, you know, you come up with a basic background. Especially if you're a, a wizard, you're you know, like if I make third level, I'm really impressed. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's incredible. Yeah. You know, and nowadays it's sort of like there's all the death saves and everything. So sort of, I, I feel it's like I understand it. It's like, the, but it's more like a fantasy, her, super heroic sort of idea as opposed oh, to the sure. original one. So, well, which, I mean, which do you prefer though? Like, which does, which gives you the when you're as a creator, 
Yeah, I think it depends what kind of a mood you're in, right? I mean, if you're in the mood for doing something deep and getting into the characters and stuff like that and playing, like when I'm playing, I generally don't do that because, again, I just put a lot of that creative effort into the work that I do. Mm -hmm. But um, I certainly understand the the impetus of that, and I design for that a lot of the time, right? Like I'm working on the Marvel game, and you know, Marvel characters don't die generally speaking, so we want to make sure you have a chance to continue. Um, and it's yeah, the original D and D came out of chainmail, right? Mm -hmm. And Dave Wesley's games, and Dave Arneson's games, and Gary's games, and uh, and that, that was basically miniatures. So you didn't you didn't care about the little miniatures. You're really, like, I'm putting forward these five guys and these six guys. And the real innovation was doing one guy at a time. I identify with this one character, and when he's gone, he's gone, right? But even then, you're like, oh, oh, my knight in arms died. You know, you didn't even name them half the time, no, right? No. So why would you care that deeply about? Now you not only name them, you come up with a backstory. You talk about their family. You talk about their friends, and it's wonderful. I mean, it's from a storyteller's point of view, it's fantastic, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, it scratches that itch, that creative itch that we all have pretty firmly. Yeah. But, um, you know, on the other hand, you get so attached to them that, what, like, for instance, I wouldn't kill somebody in a, in a standard D&D &D game these days no. unless I gave them a heads up notice, right? I wouldn't say, you know, you've put all this heart into this character. You've been creating, you've been working for levels and levels. You got all this backstory. And me just having an orc stab him out of nowhere seems anticlimactic yes. at best, right? Whereas in a, if I was playing in one of these old style games, it's like, well, the art got me. Mm -hmm. All right, next character. Yeah. You know, they're it, essentially just cookie cutter identical. So here's my know. half brother, blah, blah, blah. Just, you know. Yeah, exactly, yeah. right? Instead of this name, he's just one syllable off and, you know, same yeah, I mean, It's freeing in a sense because you don't have to be so attached mm -hmm. to that character you're playing. But on the other hand, you're not getting it very committed to it either. Right? Yes. So, again, it's a spectrum. I guess, yeah, you're right. Depends on, on the mood. Um, I'm going to change now because I know you started well help start pinnacle games way back yeah. when and one of the first ones which i love is like it's still deadlands like you know it's still one of my favorite games uh f f even now i i'd still love to play with the game what got you going with pinnacle and what made you decide a western horror theme would be the way to go well, um, I was, uh, Shane Henley and I, Shane uh, was the other co-founder of Pinnacle. Mm -hmm. uh, we're basically, you know, freelancers. We had done a bunch of stuff for TSR. We had done a bunch of stuff for West End Games. And uh, we were drinking buddies at conventions. Like we'd show up and, you know, run games all day long and then go out to the bar in the evening and have dinner or whatever. And uh, so when he was looking to do Deadlands, which is his original concept, okay. uh, uh, he's like, I want to bring in a couple of guys. He brought me and he brought in Greg Gordon. And Greg was unfortunately unable to join us. He had a lot of you know personal stuff going on in his life. He's like, I'm too busy with this. I can't manage it right now. Um, for me, you know, Shane and I had basically been you know, cutting our teeth with doing freelancing, but also I had written Western Hero and Outlaw, which were Western role playing games for champions and for role masters, oh, for Iron oh. Crown, back in like '91, '92. Okay. Um, so you know, when it came to westerns, I was deeply immersed and you know knew all the history and all that kind of stuff. Uh, probably stronger than Shane at that point. I'm sure he's done you know, much more research since then. But uh, at that point, I'm like, no, it's got to be Deadwood, 1876. This is so, look at all this crazy shit that happened, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, uh, but he was, you know, I think he had gone and seen a cover that Varam had done for White Wolf that was uh, a vampire with cross guns and a Confederate flag behind him. And mm -hmm. He thought it was just such a powerful image that he wanted to create a world that was inspired by that. Uh, and that's where Deadlands came across. And so I was uh, one of the founders of the company and I was president of the company for four years. And then we did Brave New World just before that broke up. And then uh, uh, AEG was one of our investors as well, Alderac Entertainment Group. And uh, when we split up, basically I took Brave New World, Shane took Deadlands, we took whatever chunks of debt that we had. Really <laughs> and because you know, it's a role-playing game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, went our separate ways. It's, you know, Honestly, bo uh, both he and I like to be our own bosses and having to cater to somebody else's wishes or it's... compromise with other people. It's like, well, do I really want to? Have well, especially to after four years where you know you get the, not only the creative stuff and that, but I can imagine there. Now, I do have a question on the very first one because I still, like I said, I still have, you know, my first one. But you had Bruce Campbell. I have to show this picture. You yeah, have yeah, Bruce yeah. Campbell. And I got him to actually autograph this at a convention. Nice. How did you get... Bruce Campbell on board for that? Well, there's two reasons there. Uh, Shane uh, has been the biggest Evil Dead fan forever, right? He, he literally come up to me and say, have you seen Evil Dead 2? It is the pinnacle of human achievement. And that was kind of where the name of the company came from, was the pinnacle of human achievement. So, okay, that's cool. Um, and then uh, Bruce had done Bru uh, Briscoe County Junior, mm -hmm. right? Which is a TV show replay. It was a Western TV show, kind of tongue-in-cheek Sam Raimi produced. Yeah. And uh, 
uh, at Origins one year. I was actually, I didn't get to meet him because I was running the game out of uh, Comic-Con instead because I had been doing uh, the Wild Storms collectible card game for Jim Lee and Image Comics, et cetera. And Shane was back uh, back east in Ohio or wherever the hell Origins was that year um, running that game. And because Bruce was a guest of honor at Origins, he showed up and actually stepped into a live action Deadlands game, oh, playing wow. himself as Briscoe County Jr., right? Yeah. And so Shane was just like, you know, beside himself, just, mm -hmm. yeah. And they kind of connected. And, uh, you know, uh, when we were looking for people to write introductions for, I think there was a second printing or second edition or whatever that it was. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Shane contacted Bruce and Bruce was like, yeah, sure. In fact, uh, he ended up writing a forward, one of our fiction anthologies too. And we had him and Joe Lansdale and I forget who the third one was. We did three of them, but, um, you know, it was wonderful stuff. And, you know, uh, we were deeply attached to those guys. And, you know, Bruce is just such a great actor. He's so much fun. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and he's a Michigan boy. I went to Michigan. My family, uh, my dad's from Michigan. So okay. yeah. we connected a lot over that kind of stuff. Over there, so. And that's so like, that was your, cause I, I know he has his own character in Deadlands. Like the, in the Deadlands lore, there's Ronan, uh, which is his character in that. Actually, Ronan Lynch is my character. Oh, really? Um, oh, okay. Yeah, actually, Ronan Lynch was my original character from the playtest version of Deadlands when we were starting out. That's and uh, I came up with him, and I wrote most of the stories for him, the fiction for him that came up from Deadlands. And Ronan Lynch is actually named after one of my buddies from college. Oh, uh, awesome. Uh, who, uh, who was an Irishman who, uh, uh, who came over and studied at the University of Michigan. He was a grad student when I was there. And we used to drink at a pub called Ashley's and he and his buddy, Stephen Desmond, who's now a professor, who's another Irishman, uh, would just bullshit and argue about different things. And I, but I always thought that Ronan Lynch was like the perfect gunslinger name. It's right? it's a yeah. very cool name, you know. So I stole his name and then years later he came back. He said, so, oh, oh the other one, the other one, the, when I Google myself, this is why I come up as an undead gunslinger, eh? You know, yeah, yeah, that's right. right. I'm sorry. And then there's, uh, I think, Maggie Stiefvater, uh, whatever. There's another series of uh, nowadays that's even more famous, yeah. uh, fiction series, uh, where the one of the main characters is a guy named Ronan Lynch. Oh. So he just can't win. No, it's, <laughs> uh, he's, it's his name. It's, his parents gave him the perfect it's a great name. name. You know? It's perfect. <laughs> and now, just going back about the Brave New World. Because uh, that—that's because I know you, you're talking about champions, and Brave New World seems to be the four color, the old you know, days of the four color heroes, right? It's like you have a limited options of what you're available. Now, looking back at the world as well, in some of the more current events, what gave you the sort of the dystopian idea for Brave New World? Well, you know, I was I was a big fan of dystopian literature. I had studied a little bit of it in college. I was a huge fan of comic books growing up. Uh, that's actually Patriot's mask behind me on my. Oh, mask. okay. I was sort of seeing that. Yeah, that's uh, that was from the main character Patriot from the game, mm -hmm. and we actually were, had him dressed up in costume at Gen Con the year we debuted it, and the, nice. my wife had to put in the shadow box for me. Um, you know, it was basically just uh, trying to. What I did is I sat down when I did Brave New World and said, "Okay, what if, I, what if you wanted to re-engineer, reverse engineer all the superhero tropes that we know and love, right? Mm -hmm. Like, why do you have secret identities? Where do the powers come from?" Uh, and then try to take those to the logical conclusion. Like, you know, if we had people wandering around with superpowers, what would happen? And the answer is probably people would try to regulate them, right? Mm -hmm. So the, uh, and the government would try to control them, blah, blah, blah. I mean, the, the main theme of Brave New World is what kind of freedoms are you willing to give up in order to feel safe, right? Yes. And especially if you're one of the people who has these powers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's an interesting enough topic. I'm, I'm fairly liberal. Uh, and left left leaning, but you know that's not a surprise to anybody who knows me or follows me. But uh, you know, I try to produce, come up with a subject that I thought would be an interesting topic of conversation for anybody, no matter the political stripe, mm -hmm. right? You know, say, uh, you know, what kind of you know, the game came out in 1999, mm -hmm. and then and uh, if it come out two years later after 9/11, I don't think it would have been able to sell it, right? No, uh, because at that point, people were like, yeah, we'll give you all the freedoms. We are just want yeah. to be safe, right? Because mm -hmm. we're terrified. Exactly. Yeah, that's what yes. do. So, uh, but when I was doing that game, I was like, you know, let's talk about, uh, let's have a conversation about this because we had to have terrorist attacks. Just nothing as bad as 9 11. I'm mm -hmm. like, you know, at what point do you say this is a fair trade off and why? Right. So, no, it's a very interesting world because just looking at the background, I also have your books uh, based on the Brave New World, uh, the Revelations, right, yeah. uh, Revolution, Revelations, and all that. I can't yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, three years, yes. It's um, and I thought they're interesting, but you're right. It's sort of the looking back at it now from you know our modern world back in '99. It's like, yeah, I, I could see where you're coming from. The you know, 
you know, what liberties are you willing to give up? And it's also like, how far is vigilantism allowed to go before, right. you know, because again, with comics, it's like, it actually is vigilantism. Oh, yeah, it's all over, right? The yeah. funny part is that Civil War from Marvel came out, you know, several years later. People mm-hmm. are like, they're stealing from like, No, it's, it's the same ideas, guys. It's, it's, and they're lying uh, on the ground. I picked them up, and, you know, somebody else came and picked them up, too. It's such an obvious thing when you start thinking about it. You're like, mm-hmm. well, yeah, I mean, if, if Batman was running around, it doesn't matter if he was a billionaire or not. People would be like, what's with this guy? And why are the police arresting him? And, you know, why does he have the right to do this kind of yeah. shit? And, well, that's where um, I think the Dark Knight sort of did it well, where it's like, you know, the older Batman... And the older Superman, and Superman's like, well, I'm following, I'm trying to make the law continue, you know, in Batman's point of view, he's like, yeah, but the law is, you know, breaks people's liberties. Wrong. and The people behind it are wrong. Yes. What do you do in that case, right? You know, and that's an yeah, ongoing conversation. Ongoing. So, um, going back to some other games, because I know you also worked on Lord of the Rings, uh, well, for Decipher yeah. Games. Yep. Right. And I mean, Lord of the Rings is one of those ones that there's been multiple role playing games about. I remember yeah. the original, well, one of the originals, Middle Earth or. Uh, yeah, Merc. Merc. Iron Crown. Middle Earth role playing. I actually did some stuff for that back in the day when I was working for Iron Crown when I was out of college. I did. I was their silent death line developer, but they also brought me in for doing Outlaw. And uh, they owned Champions at the time or a mm-hmm. license or whatever the situation was. So I did uh, Western Hero for them. And he also brought me in to do some work, I think, on Minus Tirith and a couple other books. Okay. Um, and I had been a huge Tolkien fan growing up. So when uh, my friends over at Decipher, who had originally been my friends at Last Unicorn Games, because oh uh, I was a role playing division of Last Unicorn, got bought by Decipher. And yes. then they said, okay, now we want you guys to do Lord of the Rings and Star Trek. We're like, man, these are pretty cool licenses. Um, and uh, Steve Wong had been in charge of the Lord of the Rings stuff. And he's a huge Loader fan too. But then he had. Uh, managed to get himself in a position where he was going to be one of the owners of the company that was publishing Champions. And you mm-hmm. know, nothing, Steve's, <laughs> Steve's number one thing in his world is Champions. He loves yes. Champions, you know, backwards and forwards. So, and he was one of these freelancers that Shane and I used to hang out with back in the day. So he's like, I'm going out to do that. So, and uh, the guys over at Last Unicorn, Christian Morrow and Sailor, they're like, uh, Matt, why don't you step up? And, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. You know, I was like, yeah, I'd be happy to. And this was before the game had actually come out. So I actually brought it across the finish line with them. Coincidentally, uh, that was uh, about 21 years ago, which I can tell you for sure, because my quadruplets just turned 21 on Monday. Oh my I was working on that game while my wife was on full bed rest in a hospital for 10 weeks trying to keep the quads in her. Oh uh, as yeah. long as she humanly could. And so, and in fact, Christian Moore actually pinged me uh, about my their 21st birthday I posted yeah. on Facebook. Whatever. He's like, yeah, I remember you were working on that. And, you know, like on your Palm Pilot. I'm like, yeah. I like oh, a, my goodness. That's... I had like a bright orange clamshell eye, uh, iBook, one of those ones. And then I also had a Palm Pilot with a fold-out keyboard I used when I was, you know, it had to travel really light uh, back before we had iPhones and all the other Yes. Things. Well, I, I'm Every happy day. nowadays with PDS because I'm sure you remember two of the game days where it's like, okay, well, you know, even Deadlands at the time and, you know, other ones, it's like, okay, here's your main books, here's your compendiums, here's your add ons, here's all this sort of stuff. So it's, yeah, like, it's like, okay. People would have to bring a, a rollerboard suitcase with them just to be able to go to a gaming session. Yeah, yes. It's kind of nice. And it's like, okay, well, and under, you know, again, it's just sort of the ones where modern time has made it better. Now, when you're creating, though, do you still create with pen and paper? Like, that or do you have you gone to the, the full digital well what i when i create i i generally do everything by typing right i'm, I'm a typist I, I can't do things by long end. i'm a terrible it takes me forever i'm a very quick typist although i confess that i'm a terrible typist too if it wasn't for the backspace key i probably wouldn't have a career right so <laughs> and i learned how to type on manual typewriters so mm-hmm. back when you had to put in white out and you know the whatever the stuff was oh, that you put in i, I remember those days too yes and all that yeah, crazy um so most of my stuff I do digitally when I have to draw maps or something like that, I'll do it by hand and then just scan that in. But uh, I'll, you know, it's, uh, I'm working in Microsoft Word or if I'm laying stuff out, I'm working in InDesign or whatever the hell the latest program happens to be for, yeah, we start on Quark and PageMaker and stuff like that. Um, and But, you know, the end result, whether it's PDF or print, we think we're going to print and then the PDF is really often a byproduct of that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and you can do stuff that's PDF only. In fact, I've done some of that stuff. But again, you know, most of the time now, because, you know, the tablets are like this, the screens are like this, it's generally people expect them to be as uh, as print type as they can be. So we, we focus on that. 
Um, so, yeah, which I think is fun. Yeah, uh, for me, uh, yeah, as I get older, my eyes get weaker and get screwed up, and I'm like, oh, you know, the ability to be able to go woof and make it bigger. I'm like, thank you. Well, yes, I, reading glasses. It's one of those ones, yep. like you know, because I'm older than you, actually, believe it or not. Uh, but I'm also yeah, another August, know. another August person. I'm August, yeah. middle of August. It's there, so happy early birthday. Same here, yes. So, uh, and I, I was going now. How, are you familiar with Roll Twenty and Foundry and stuff like that for the online for gaming? Sure. Yeah. So I know that during the pandemic, the people I've talked to said that sort of actually helped gaming again because they were forced to stay at home and they're like, well, I'm not just going to just sit here by myself, be lonely. I want to reach out and talk to other people. And internationally, I think it helped grow the communities. Do you, yeah, do I think you agree? you're absolutely right. I, I think, uh, well, gaming generally does well in downturns of the economy, whether they're forced by a pandemic or something else, because... Uh, you know, gaming is something where you buy it once and you play it dozens of times, right? You know, if you spend a hundred dollars taking your family to the movies, you know, three hours later you're done. Mm -hmm. uh, you spend a hundred dollars on role playing game products, you can play them for years, mm -hmm. right? And the dirty secret, of course, in role playing games is you really only need the basic rules, and then you can just build off that, assuming you like to. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the stuff is optional add-ons that just make your life easier, which you know is perfectly fine. I write a lot of those too. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, as far as budget goes, they are one of the most budget-friendly types of games you can do, right? Yes. Now, when it comes to doing the virtual stuff, yeah, I think we had done a lot of virtual stuff before that, the Roll20, you know, mm -hmm. Demi Planes doing stuff, uh, all this different kind of thing. Um, but it's when we're suddenly trapped in houses, miles, you know, even if your best friend is, like, six doors down, but you're not bubbled up with them during the pandemic, like, well, I'm not supposed to go over there. How do we do this? So. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Roll20 and a lot of those other apps like Shard and, and Foundry and all these other great things, um, they made it easy. I mean, you can suddenly do this again. And then people start getting used to that. Like, oh, but I can do these effects. I can do lighting. I can reveal this this way. And you're like, yeah, well, it's you know. uh, interesting to see how you're going to transport that to the, the actual tabletop once mm -hmm. you can start playing together. Again. I, I, uh, I realized that recently because I, I was stuck in an area where I was Roll20, and I realized how much work is actually involved in Roll20. Because you, you want to have the pictures, you want to have the maps, you want to have that stuff. Now that I've gone back to playing with you know a group in person, we're doing a lot more of the narrative style. Because I don't need a map or a picture for everybody. It's like, okay, you know what a, an old knight looks like. Yep. Picture him yourself, you know. Whereas before, you'd want to help, you know, just stimulate the conversation. You always want to have a picture. I find Roll20 had a lot of work for the background stuff, like for the images and stuff. Whereas mm -hmm. the narrative gives me more flow of changing the story as it happens. Right. right? I mean, well, the trick is you could play a role-playing game over Zoom. Mm -hmm. right? I did a bunch of play testing over Zoom and, you know, FaceTime and all these other different apps. Uh, as long as you're not worried about tactical combat, right? Yes. As soon as you start getting into tactical combat, where, you know, where you need to know where things are and, you know, how they're positioned against each other and what else is in the room with you, then Roll20 and, and those VTTs are fantastic. Mm -hmm. right? You really can't beat them. There's a new one coming out. Oh, what's it called? Mirror Escape, right? I don't know if you've seen this one, but these guys I've talked to a few different yeah, times. Yes, so I've, I've seen some uh, ads for them. Basically, it's an alter, uh, alternate reality app where you take your iPad or whatever, or your, your iPhone, and you'd say, this is the table we're all playing at. And oh. it builds the scenario and the, the 3D train right in front of you. Oh, right? really nice. So you can zoom in. You can walk down the corridors. Pretty neat stuff. That's right? pretty good. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's. Uh, I think you're just uh, going to be coming out with the full-on beta this summer, actually. Mm -hmm. Maybe the full-on release. Because I, I played around with it a few times. You're like, wow, this is pretty damn cool. That's pretty and cool. once we start, you know, you know, now that Apple's done their AR kits and all this, now, you know, I don't know what it would take to outfit a table of six. You're talking you know, tens of thousands of dollars. Right? Well, that's just, yeah, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> because, like, you know, we want, to, we want to have the table with the, you know, the LED screen on the bottom so people can see what happens and you can quickly change it and that. And you're like, so how much money is that? Okay, go, let's go back to the map and just draw. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go buy a car. I'll see you later. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, for people who got tons of money, and that's actually one of the interesting things about role-playing games, is when you're doing role-playing games, a lot of times you're just selling people books and they're like 50 bucks each or whatever they happen to be. And that's all the money you ever get out, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons that Hasbro is like, well, how do we get more money out of our consumers? That's a business's job. Because oh, yes, right? yes. they want to make sure that they can keep, you know, keep the doors open, keep producing stuff. Um, but when you start doing that higher-end stuff, like some of those fantastic gaming tables and the lighting and projection screens oh. and all, you know, the last game board is another really cool one it's basically a massive touch screen you play on top of right? oh my goodness uh, this is you, know, you, you can load in whatever it's your D, &D game your settlers of Catan, or whatever you want um and it's a lot of fun but 
you know, those are for higher end stuff. But if you want to, basically, all you really need is a bunch of friends who are willing to get together and, you know, riff off each other. Mm -hmm. You barely need rules. You barely no. need, drinks, you know, especially if you know what you're doing. Yes. And you can basically do it over a phone call. You know, we, I used to do it in the back of our, uh, social studies class when I was in high oh, school. Oh, yes. Yeah. Teachers not paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. And like you said, it's as long as you're, you don't really, you know, just need some dice. But after um, that, it's like everything's up in your mind. Um, I don't, do you remember a game called Castle Falkenstein? Oh, yeah, yeah. Art Tell Story and Mike Pondsmith and Kurt. Yeah, great stuff. Oh, it was, a, yeah. it was a great game. And I ran it for many years. And my my players knew to give me a bottle of wine beforehand. So it was like, you know, <laughs> so after a while, it's like, can I try this? Sure, why not? Sure, yeah. You know, because those games where it's like just go with the rules, give it a try, right? Yeah. Uh, exactly. Now you talked about champions. Now, how do you feel about that system? Yeah, I like it, but it, it's uh, I like all sorts of things, and I like them for what they're good for, right? Champions is a game that uh, it's built for physics professors and engineers, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not built for like loose storytelling, right? It's no. built for like they literally break down seconds into into twelfths of a second. Right? Yeah. Oh yeah, second. It's, yeah. And while that's perfectly wonderful and realistic and, and amazing engineering goes in the game design, not everybody cares about that. No. Right? They're like, did I punch the guy? Did he go through a wall? That's all you want. Yeah. Right. I, I tell people it's one of the best games to design any character you want because yeah. if, if, for design. A character, it's perfect. You can do all sorts of things. You can put in all the limitations, all the everything you want to have, and then you hit combat, and then it's super. But, you know, but again, if that's what you want to do, if you want oh, to see yes. like the slow motion, like nope. you know the guy's face going getting distorted as you do it, it's great for that. The Western Hero book I wrote was based on Champions, right? Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing is that Champions is a great game for superheroes. It compresses really poorly when you start getting down to the lower end of stuff, right? So, yes. Uh, and there was a Murphy's Law comic that Steve Jackson Games did about my Western Hero at one point. Oh, really? You know, the Scorpions in Western Hero can basically pick up a safe, run off with it like a printer, <laughs> and you can't and cannot be killed with a baseball bat. Because <laughs> yeah, when you try to put a Scorpion into the stats there, there's just – there it's – doesn't compress any further on the lower end. Mm -hmm. At the upper end, it's fantastic, right? And over the years, you get different solutions for that. Greg Gordon, you know, was one of the guys we originally talked about Pinnacle with, did DC Heroes, the original game, which had a logarithmic. <coughs> yes. Right, which again, if you understand logs, it's fantastic. It's actually really intuitive. I spent a summer teaching people how to play that. Uh, Mayfair Games uh, paid me to go to conventions mm -hmm. and game stores and do that when I was in college. Uh, but, you know, the trouble is having to explain logarithms to people. You're like, yeah. Well, if you're up for higher math, you know, here you, know, stuff <laughs> here you go. You know, and upper high school level. I remember their, their wheel chart. They had the wheel chart, you know, to move around. And you're, you're right. If you understood higher end maths or, or could grasp that concept, it was simple. Yeah. If it wasn't, yeah. you're sitting there going like, so I go from here to this. And it's, yeah. <laughs> but I'm doing game design now where we're like, you know, we're just doing adding. Is is double digits too much? Is, mm -hmm. you know, or, and is, should we or, should we try multiplication at all? Yeah. Or, you know, uh, if we keep it to single digits, is that okay, right? Yeah. So when you start thinking about logarithms, you're like, man, this is way beyond all that mm -hmm. stuff, right? And that's, again, perfectly fine. But I mean, the, the trick is now, if you want to play a game that's really math intensive and it does it all for you, computers can do that a lot faster than the rest of us can, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you want something, I think role-playing games nowadays tend to lean into things that people are better at than computers, which is, you know, uh, extemporaneous dialogue, coming up with solutions off the top of your head, riffing on things very quickly and not caring too much about the actual particulars, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, a, a video games can be able to do that better than a human can do. Oh, just... Exactly. No, because like my buddy's been playing since, well, the 80s or before the 80s as well. And it's, again, it's a lot of the games like Aftermath, Champions and all that got their start from, you know, very complicated. And at the time, it was, you know, oh, I, I can do this. I'm smart because I know how to, I can figure this out. Oh, yeah. To the more, can we just get some fluff? You know, like just <laughs> make the rules very basic just to have some sort of set to say, okay, this is how things are done. But we want the more of the experience of the actual play, you know. Because yeah. that. No, that, I think, is where uh, tabletop games shine is when you have that actual interaction with human beings who are making mm -hmm. stuff up. You know you're just on the edge. You know, like you're, you're just, is this going to work? Does this conceptually work? Is it, is, and that's the kind of stuff that a video game can't do because it's all programmed in. I mean, I work in video games too, right? Yes. But when we're doing video games, we're engineering those experiences for you and we can make them really exciting, but it's all mathematically very precise. And, you know, there's not a lot of room for, no. uh, for 
ex for expanding it, right? Yes. Like I, sometimes when I sit down and write video game stuff, I'm like, how many characters do I have in this box of dialogue, right? Do I have 80 characters? Do everything has to fit within that, you know, mm -hmm. or do I have more? Or what, what happens if I want to add more here? With a role playing game, you're like, just keep talking. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and see, this reminds my mind. Like, I know video games, and people call them, oh, it's a computer role playing game. I'm like, I have an issue. It's not a real role playing game. I, yeah. I know. Yeah. I, because it, it's there's certain things that you must do or can do, whereas in a role playing game, it's like you want to go off and do your own thing. You want to try something different. I'll make up a rule, you know, and go yeah, for it. it. It sticks in my cross still a little bit that role. Or if you say RPG now, people think video games because they're yeah. just much more popular. But people play more. Right? Unfortunately, you want to say tabletop games, and we have to say tabletop. Yes, games. I know. <laughs> TTRG. That's okay. You know, yeah. you, you have to. The point of any communication is to try to be clear with people, mm -hmm. right? But if if I say RPG and you don't understand what I mean, then I have to clarify. So yes, let's clarify exactly. Now we're, we've talked champions a bit. We talked about uh, you know DC. There was also another big one back in the day. <laughs> Notice my train of thought here, Marvel. Because I, yeah, I, 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 I've heard, the, I have the original, one of the original Marvel ones, which was again, yeah. they had the column shifts and everything it was pretty much straightforward. But again, it was more the if you weren't super powerful, the odds of you hitting anything were very minimalistic. Yep. Uh, now, Marvel is another one that's gone through many different uh, companies writing the games for them. Yep. You know, we're on the fifth version now. And uh, <laughs> so, um, no, okay, I have to ask it though. No, I can talk a little bit about it. Go ahead. Yeah, well, it's more of like how did how did they contact? Like, was it did you reach out to them or did they contact you? Oh was it... no, no. Um, uh, let's see the. This is the fifth version of a Marvel game. There's one that came out from TSR. Yes, There's I remember. the second one that came out from TSR. The first one was Jeff Grubb and Steve Winter. The, third one, the second one was uh, Mike Salinker and crew, right? And then there was an edition of Marvel published by themselves back around 2000 that was uh, used little stones called Marvel Universe. Yes, yes. And then there was one in about 2010 from Margaret Weiss Productions. That was actually on the design team for, uh, kind of as a consultant more than anything else, that Cam Banks was the head of. Uh, and that only had a couple books come out before it ended up being canceled. And then it just kind of sat there for a while, right? And, you know, as D&D &D got more popular and, and such, and uh, fifth edition has just been blowing the doors off everything. I think the folks at Marvel were like, you know, why are we not involved in this? And uh, the guy who was the publisher of Marvel at the time was named John Nee. And John uh, turned out to be an old friend of mine. Uh, oh. John was a guy who uh, I mentioned before, I did the Wildstorm's collectible mm -hmm. card game for Jim Lee's division of Image Comics, yeah. which was Wildstorm. And Jim ended up selling that division to DC Comics back about 15, 20 years ago, whatever it was, maybe 20 years ago. Now. Jeez, I'm getting old. Oh, um, <laughs> and, uh, and then John, who was his vice president at Wildstorm, uh, went over and moved to DC Comics and worked with him there for a while. And then he left them and he ended up being one of the co-founders of Cryptozoic Games. And then he also ended up being the publisher of Marvel Comics. So when he was at Marvel, he's like, Matt. And I, because I had done game design with him mm -hmm. at Wildstorm. He's like, and, you know, I wrote two editions of the Marvel Encyclopedia. I wrote Avengers Encyclopedia. I wrote books about Captain America. I wrote tons. I wrote for a couple different Marvel uh, video games. Oh, right. So uh, on top of all that, John comes in and says, Matt, uh, we need to have you do this. We need to do a role playing game. You're the guy. I'm like, well, I think you're right. I am the guy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, there are a number of people I know that would be just as good at me as it, right? But I'm, uh, but I have given my track record and the stuff that I've done and everything else. I, I was clearly one of the top choices, mm -hmm. oh, that's good. Uh, and it made sense. It, I'm not trying to be arrogant there. No, it's no, like, no. It's it's oh, like... you know, given all the stuff I'd done, the people I'd worked with, the fact they knew they could uh, rely on me, I could tell them, you know, five friends of mine that could do it as well. You know, there's guys like Steve Kenson and uh, Steve Wong and a number of other people who uh, Mike Seneker, Cam Banks, who done the original editions, Jeff Grubb, whatever. All these guys would have done great. Stephen Shen, who worked on a couple of different editions too, they would do great jobs of this too. But uh, again, because I had that personal connection with them, I'd known them, um, it, it worked out pretty well. In fact, after I started talking to John about it, I ended up being a guest of honor at a convention on Sweden called Norsham, mm -hmm. up in northern Sweden, just about 20 miles south of the Arctic Circle. And one Jeez. of the other guests there happened to be C.V. Sobolski, <laughs> editor in chief of Marvel. And yeah. C.V. and I had talked a number of times back when he was just Marvel, what well, just Marvel's <laughs> talent scout, right? Yeah. And I was like, "How do I break in here?" He's like, "You're a writer. Good luck. We don't, you know, it's it's tough." Mm -hmm. um, but so C.V. and I had known each other for a number of years, and John and I had known each other for a number of years, and I knew a bunch of other people in the company. It wasn't 
that long, how far of a stretch for them to ask me to do this. So. Okay. Out. And that uh, that's and being honestly, really... I was I was kind of out of doing tabletop role playing games. I'm like, oh, really? Know? At that point in time, because you're more of the comics well, and video games. I would do them, but I would do them kind of like uh, I'm a Kickstarter stretch goal, or I'm going to do. Like, I have a personal project I did called Shotguns and Sorcery. That, <laughs> yes, uh, I, I saw that. Yes. game I did. Yes. Um, so I would do them, but I, it was not my bread and butter. It was not what I was going to rely on my uh, my income for because I do this full time. Because I make a lot more money doing uh, video games, to be honest with you. Um, and, you know, I'm like, yeah, you know, basic role-playing game design. I might do it for fun if the right thing comes along. And then Sean comes and says, would you be interested in Marvel, Matt? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah. Like, well, you know, I had at one point given up doing tie-in novels, too. I was thought mm-hmm. I was used to write original novels from here on out. Yeah. And then uh, an editor I knew got the license to Halo. And I'm like, oh, Jesus. Yeah, I, I, I saw your Halo ones there. Yes. That's... Um, and I'm like, oh, uh, please. And Ed's like, I was just writing you. We're going to do this. So, you know. <laughs> Now do? the new Marvel one comes out in July. Are you going to be doing yes. a? Are oh, you going to be doing August? Comes out August second. August second. August second. Yeah. Cool. Are you going to be doing a book tour with them? You know, are they going to pop yeah, you and say, really, "Hey, I mean, you know, uh, Marvel doesn't generally do book tours. Uh, yeah. They, you know, they send their comic book creators to conventions occasionally, but usually they're brought out by the convention. The uh, local comic book shops will do stuff, so they don't really have a, a structure in place to do that kind of thing. However. Uh, I am going to be at uh, San Diego Comic Con pushing the game, which is a couple weeks before the game's official release. Mm-hmm. We're going to have a big debut at Gen Con, which is you know my favorite show ever. Oh, this is going to be like my forty second. Show. I know, but going since I was pretty young, you know? yeah. Uh, and because uh, I grew up in Southern Wisconsin, which is where Gen Con happened to be. Yes. And, uh, I would tell people if I grew up in LA, I'd have gotten into film. I've grown up in New York, I'd have gotten into traditional book publishing, but. I grew up in Southern Wisconsin, so I got into role playing games, tabletop role playing games. Because um, you just, wherever your creative itch is and That's... You, know, you have it, you want to express it somehow, and it's wherever the people locally are able to do mm-hmm. that. With you. Uh, so I'm going to be at Gen Con, I'm going to be at uh, Comic Con. I think we're going to be at New York Comic Con as well. Uh, I'm going to be doing Game Hole Con up in Madison uh, in, nice. in October as well. I'm going to guest there regularly, so I'm going to play a few versions of that there. Too. So I guess you met Gary Gygax then. Oh, I worked for Gary actually back when I was in college. Um, uh, I was uh, one of the I was a freelancer for New Infinities Productions, which was his company after TSR. Okay, right? is which, that the one that did uh, er, the AE Earth one? No, uh, it's the one that did Cyborg Command. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> which was not a good game by any stretch okay, of the imagination. But uh, there you go. You know, it's a, uh, um, and I, I don't mean to slag. I mean everybody. You know, it was their baby, and they liked it. I try not to slag in anybody's creative effort because anytime anything actually gets produced, it's a freaking miracle. Well, that, that, that's why I say for, you know, um, any movie or film or, or it's like, I respect anyone that can do it. Yeah. Because it's yeah. like, not only is it hard to do and finish something, I'm sure you're well aware of, but then to put yourself out there and say, hey, this is what I did. Yeah. It takes also a lot of guts to, you know, well, actually. Yeah. It's not just the guts, though. It's the fact that you had the drive to actually make it happen and mm-hmm. to finish it and get it produced and put it in front of people. Sure, it might not be as good as somebody else's. Sometimes it's better, right? But mm-hmm. honestly, just the fact you managed to do that is a huge freaking accomplishment. I try to respect that with everybody. Uh, with New Infinities, you know, I was doing, I was editing books for them and I edited some adventure stuff that I think only a couple novels ever came out. They were by Richard Lee Byers and their horror line that they were doing. Uh, but I ended up, uh, they gave me Gary's Master of the Game book, which had gone through a couple of editors. They're like 20 years old. And they're like, hey, what, you want to give it a shot? I'm like, okay, sure. sure. Um, I actually found a uh, a uh, unpublished Gary Gygax novel in my attic oh, several wow. years ago yeah. uh, that had been given me to edit, then a company folded. And I'm just like, well, I guess, you know, I ended up uh, giving it back to his widow. So oh, nice. Gail's got it. So, um, but yeah, like, you know, it's, it's, wild stuff yeah i knew gary pretty well uh and i knew him right until he died and then uh uh i was at his funeral so i went to uh, gary con zero as we now call it right yeah. his family was there and we had a they had a big reception at the american legion hall right after that in downtown lake geneva which is actually where i went to my first ever convention of winter fantasy back in like 82 or 83 something like that yeah. and uh God, as I walked in, it was just it just like a flood of memories come back. I'm like, oh, I know the bathroom is down here around the corner and you know, and, oh, and, and, wow. and whatever. And the Gygax girls were always over here selling hot dogs at the stand and whatever. And I'm like, 
and you know, I sat down with Duke Seifried, who was one of the original TSR guys from way back when. He showed me his book of clippings and told me about his time in the CIA. And you're know, like, you know, like, I, yeah, Duke's one of these guys. You're like, I don't know if all the stories are true, but damn it, they're so. They're, fun they're just, I'll here. sit here and have a drink yeah. with you and just enjoy them. Oh yeah, just yeah. amazing. Right? Now, uh, and Gary Count 15 just happened. Uh, oh, Luke, nice. uh, Luke Gygax has been running that, him and the family, yeah. for years. And I've been a guest there many years over. Nice. And man, if you get a chance to come out to uh, Wisconsin in March for Gary Count, it's a blast. Okay, I'll have to try that because I'm. they want me to go to Adepticon, which is the Warhammer 40. Another great show. It was the same weekend this year. Yeah, then that's just it. It's like, yeah. uh, now, you've done so much. You've done comics. You've done, you know, card games. You've done video games. You've done role-playing games. How come we've no, no TV or movies for you? Well, TV and movies are a whole different industry, right? I actually did write a script for a movie that came out that, uh, again, uh, was not great B-level, maybe C-level movie called Inspectors that Darren Orange directed. He's a friend of mine. He was a big fan of Brave New World, so he asked me to help him out with the script. And I did a rewrite on the script. Um, the main reason is because I would have to bang my head against Hollywood. Uh, and okay, yes. I, I know a lot of people have done that. i got a lot of friends who are actually pretty high up in Hollywood. and. Um, but I also, I, I know a lot of really talented people and they're like, well, we moved out to LA. I was never willing to like pick up stakes and move to LA, mostly because I had five young kids at home mm -hmm. and I didn't really want to move them around. Also, I know the cost of living increase between Wisconsin, where I live, and LA is it's staggering. insane. Yeah. Um, yeah. For instance, actually at one point, Mattel tried to hire me to be a uh, director of a collectible games division, right? We had gone into negotiations over this and they're like, all right, how much do you make as a freelancer living in Wisconsin? I told them, and they're like, all right, let's see. Now, the cost of living increase, they're like, oh, 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 we would have to pay you more than your boss's boss. <laughs> yeah. To move <laughs> like, yeah, we're not well, we I guess I'll keep freelancing. I'll stay here then, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, it's not that like I haven't had ambitions or wouldn't like to do that kind of stuff, but uh, I was never willing to, it would have been a step down for me in terms of pay for that, to move out there and do it. Uh, now, if one of them hit, obviously, I'd be, you know, multi, -multi yeah. Well, that's what I was sort of like, like, you know, thinking of Deadlands movie or TV series or, you know, Well, Shane's New tried World. to do that a number of times. There's been a number of ones in the works. And, you know, like, well, my a uh, few of my novels have been optioned for film, too. Right? Oh, yeah, it's nice. Uh, and, like, the first thing I ask you is, are you willing to write it? I'm like, yes. They're like, for free? No. No. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> no. no. I'm not sure if you understand this, but I, I mean, that's time out of my pocket. That's yes. money I, I earn. So my kids don't eat on me doing shit for free. So. <laughs> Um, so, uh, other actually there's for instance there's actually i did a book called a mortals which is about the world's oldest man who gets uh revived into clone bodies with the secret yes. service and uh, he's been viciously murdered and now has to go out and solve his own murder right so okay and it got option for a film and there was a screenplay written by a guy who's got films produced that you would recognize uh and they shopped it around and didn't go anywhere okay. Like, okay and they kept optioning it for like 10 years yeah uh which meant a little bit you know like a couple grand here and there every showing up every few years like well, yeah, nice. You're fine. Just keep, keep sticking the eye. Yeah. So. Well, because that's, that's what they call the you know, in, in pre production hell, which is sort of like, you know, development hell. It's like, we want to do this. But yeah, you're right. Hollywood is sort of the how much money are we going to make on it? I don't know. You know, and yeah, that's where. I mean, look at what they're doing right now with these guys striking. And a lot of them are friends of mine who are doing this kind of stuff. Oh, yes. They... You know, because they are just getting abused. The the people, the, uh, yes. the companies that are doing this stuff are abusing the hell out of writers and most creatives in Hollywood. Well, and I'm proud of them for standing up and doing this stuff. Same here. You know, uh, you know, as the writer rooms get smaller and the seasons get smaller, but you're supposed to, and you're supposed to do tons of free work so you can get work. Mm -hmm. I'm like, guys, I didn't want to wander into that on my own as no. an adult who's you know already making a living doing creative stuff. Honestly, I make better money doing video games. Right? And, and that's where I also like just the the writer's strike is. I've always felt that you know I'll watch a B movie any day that has, and a lot of times they have better writing than some you know huge billion dollar you know. Oh, sure. And you're like, pay the writers. If you have good writers with a good script, good dialogue, your movie will work. Well, the know? writer's basically the architect, right? It's, it, they're, they're just the guys who come up with the idea. The person who comes up with the idea and says, this is what we think it should be like. And that's up to the director and all the other people to actually make that plan mm -hmm. work, right? But if you have a shitty plan, you don't end yeah. up with a really good building. You know? Yes, exactly. And, and you're right. Like the whole idea now with the streaming services, like, you know, that's been a big contention between actors and directors and writers because it's like, so streaming, you're making basically free money, but you're not yeah. paying, you know, the people who produce it for you yeah. or and make it, it for you. It used to be that if you did a show or a film or whatever, then it gets sold into syndication or be sold on reruns, or whatever. But nowadays, you know, if Disney produces a show, they just stream it. And there's nothing, there's no follow on after that. So you don't no. ever end up getting any residuals. 
and uh, trying to the, trying to track them down for how many times it's been seen and what the advertising revenue. Because that's the other thing too is like in the old days, okay, here's how many theaters showed our show. Here's how much money we made from the theaters. Now it's the streaming service. Like, well, how many times did it get viewed? What sort of advertisement do you get from that? And and I can understand. Like, I'm, I don't like to, you know Disney back them up for that, but I can understand their point of view of like, how do you know how much money you made from that? Yeah, you don't, right? You it's know. tricky. But that's the reason you have to have proper negotiation where you make sure that each side is, has enough power that can be equally represented for this kind of stuff. So that otherwise what happens is you end up driving people out of work so that only wealthy people can actually afford to write. Yes. Right, to, can afford to create. People are already wealthy. And, you know, from a diversity point of view, you're basically saying only wealthy, straight, white dudes yes. are going to be able to pull this off because they've got a head start from generations. And I say this as a straight white dude, right? No, but they have a head start from generations of wealth behind you that uh, that marginalized people don't have. No. And that just is wrong. I mean, there's such a wealth of stories out there. It, it, well, it, why should we limit ourselves to only people who are wealthy enough to start in this thing? And, and that's just it. Like, when you look at the fact that the, a low-end movie now is considered $50 million, you're like, yeah, exactly. What? what? <laughs> yeah. You know. And the writer shouldn't get any of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, 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 so this is where, like I said, like Bruce Campbell's been one of my heroes, well, I guess an idols for movies because he yeah. realized what Hollywood was like. So he went out and was like, okay, raise the money yourself. Do your own stuff. You know, well, that's it, how he and Rainey started out. I mean, uh, back in Michigan when they were doing Evil Dead, right? Yeah. Uh, they're just a bunch of kids made their own movie. Well, and you know, like, like, oh, we know how to two, do this. Yeah, it's Mam Screen, Mam Two Brains, or Mam Screen Brains, all those ones. But again, it's I, I like those movies because yeah, they're not the the most polished, but you can tell the people who had you know a love for this. Yeah, you can see that they had fun doing it too, mm. right? You really want to see a movie that people enjoyed making, as opposed to something they tortured themselves for, right? That, I, it takes some of the fun out of it for me if I think the people making the movie were miserable. Yes, right? and then it was you know, when it becomes just sort of mundane. It's like, okay, do I have to do this again? Yeah, exactly. And I, I mean, guess every, that's... every job is work. I mean, I do some pretty fun stuff, right? It's still work. You still have to sit yourself down, ply your butt to the chair, and make mm -hmm. things happen. So you deserve to get paid for that, right? Just yeah. because it's fun doesn't mean you shouldn't get paid for it, especially if you're making money for other people. Well, yeah, that's just it. Like if you were just to hand out your gaming book and say, I'm not selling it, it's you know free, here's a free PDF, that's different. But yeah. you know, it's going to a publishing company, they're selling it, you know, there's stores selling it, so it's you know, or same well, for videos. People ask you to do stuff for free. My general rule is if somebody else is making money off it, I should be paid for it, right? That makes a yeah. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. If it, if we're doing it for free for fun, for charity, whatever, then sure. But if somebody is making money off this, then that should be split. I'm not here to enrich you. So oh, that makes sense. Um, I'll finish off with one thing there, uh, Matt. So out of all the decades you've done stuff, all the different things that you've done, when you're looking back, what's the one thing that to you seems like, you know, that's besides your family, obviously, because <laughs> obviously that's that's the most important to you. But other that's than that, easy, it's like, what, what game, you know, you know, convention or something that's like, that's the one you're like, I'm most proud of that one. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, Brave New World is probably my most personal project. So I'm pretty proud of that. And I'm actually, I have the rights back to it now. So at some point in the future, Congratulations. I'm going to be, you know, coming out of the new edition or whatever. But yes. since I started the Marvel game, I was like, you know, I didn't feel comfortable working on two superhero games at once for fear that I would rob one and impoverish the other. And I don't think that's a good way to do things. So um, so when I'm, once I've, you know, got the Marvel game coming out, which is coming out this summer, uh, then I'm going to take a look at Brave New World and see what I can do with it there. That's very important. Um, one of the other neat things that we, uh, is just really odd that it came out this way, but, uh, you know, Gen Con's a big thing in my life. I've been doing mm -hmm. it for years and years. I've helped them on a number of levels, but many years ago, 22, 23 years ago, a guy named James Wallace started a mailing list of friends to give out an award for games called the Diana Jones Award, Right. And uh, the reason he did is because he had somehow gotten a pub trivia trophy handed to him that was apparently traded back and forth between the guys who used to run TSR UK and the guys who used to be at Games Workshop. And the uh, it was uh, uh, after they had gotten after TSR UK had been shut down, they had burned a copy of the Indiana Jones role playing game. Right. And they had stuck. All, whoop, that's my father trying to call oh, it. Sorry. <laughs> Hold on. Um, he. Uh, uh, the 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 trophy basically has a burnt up copy of the Indiana Jones role playing game encased encased in a plexiglass pyramid. Nice. And he's like, well, I got a trophy. We should come up with an award to go with it. So we just the only part of the logo that's left says Diana Jones instead of Indiana. <laughs> so, um, 
And so we started this off as kind of a, a lark, you know, joke, really at Gen Con. And we started giving it out to people. Peter Atkinson was the guy who won it first. And we just kept giving it out every year. And we just, whatever we think was the coolest thing in game, doesn't matter what it is. It could be a game, person, concept. Uh, one year Irish gaming charity auctions won, you know. it's okay. uh, So we're pretty loose and easy about it. But over the years, people started to take it seriously, right? And they're like, this is a deep honor. And we're like, well, we're, we just thought you were cool. You know, that's all we're doing. Um, but because of that, we started, uh, we did start doing something three years ago called the Emerging Designers Program, where we're bringing in uh, generally marginalized people, but really just anybody who's uh, uh, in the first three or four years of their game publishing career, right, yeah. uh, as a designer, bringing them in and basically bringing them to Gen Con, uh, giving them a stipend, paying for the room, putting them up, introducing them to people, and trying to help, you know, kickstart their career, essentially, mm. right? And uh, the Emerging Designer Program is now in its third year. We did four people are bringing in this year. They're fantastic folks. Uh, they're doing some amazing stuff in games. And we actually became a, five, a nonprofit organization, a 501c3 last year. So, we're actually oh, yeah, so now I'm the, I'm the president of a, of a nonprofit, which is just not something I ever had any ambition <laughs> to do. But, but yeah, I'm kind of proud of it. I think uh, we do some good work and we also run this. Uh, the ceremony is basically the party we have on Gen Con Eve at Gen Con every year. Wednesday night, we say, come on in. You set up your booth. Have a drink with us. We'll chill out. We'll stop everything for 15, 20 minutes, give out an award, and then we'll go back and chat with our buddies, you know, and then mm -hmm. Gen Con the rest of the weekend. So, well, uh, But it's become this much more important thing, and we're, I'm just kind of, you know. Well, that's, 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 that's very impressive, and, and yes, congratulations for, you know, like, like it's amazing how things develop over time. You know, yeah, I mean, there's no plan to do that. <laughs> so, just kind of, you know, but you know, life is that way sometimes. Like you just you figure out which way you stumble, and then if you want to keep stumbling in that direction, you know. Oh, so. That's good. Well, congratulations. Um, if you're ever in Ottawa, in at the end of May, there's the Canadian Tabletop Championship uh, that right. started out. It's been our their second one, and it's we're trying to develop for tabletop role playing and board games, or you know, we're trying to get it to grow and stuff like that. But if you're out there, out here in uh, end of May, you're more than welcome to come set up a booth and just, you know, or just have oh, a few beers that. with us. I've been to Canada in many years. I used to go to school in Ann Arbor. It's just across the border. Then we would go to, to Windsor because it was a 19 drinking age. Holiday. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm in uh, Ontario, so it's 19 in Ontario, but across from me, it used to be 18 in Quebec. See, there you go. So it was <laughs> one, not that I, you know, drank underage, you know, <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> In that. So uh, thank you very much, Matt, for joining Out of the Basement for this. It's been a pleasure and an honor to chat with you about everything. Uh, you have yourself a great day. You too. Thanks a lot, Patrick.